For those of you whom I don't know, I'm Steve Clemens. I run the American Strategy Program here at the New America Foundation. Oh, definitely, uh, definitely get him a cookie. More. Uh, I'm back on South Beach, so I can't enjoy them. I just have to be a voyeur uh, and enjoy others watching. Today, I'm, I'm really excited about today's program. Um, I was just talking to George Lakoff out, outside, and the, the whole um, job of think tanks, people in the public policy environment, in which the lines between uh, think tank wonks like me or advocates or NGO people, people uh, uh, thinking about the political environment and ecosystem in general, had become a lot more blurred. And we realized that, well, on one hand, our job essentially is also to try to think smartly and differently about public policy solutions, pragmatic solutions to try and solve some of the problems that are out there. Having a conversation with real people uh, is also a very key part of this. And thinking about where voters are, I spend a lot, and I don't, I don't, I'm not shy away from uh, from this. I, many of you know, I have a blog called the Washington Note, and I know that my audience typically is not the grassroots audience. My audience are typically senators and congressmen, people on the Hill, who also require a certain kind of uh, dialogue and conversations to reach them, which is not a grassroots dialogue. In the John Bolton battle, uh, and I recognize that some of you may be nephews or cousins, and I am, uh, 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 and I appreciate that. I'd never presume people's politics, but I had something to do with the, John, the bottle over, uh, battle over John Bolton's confirmation uh, process when he was uh, nominated by President Bush to serve as ambassador to the United Nations. I use Lakoff. Lakoffism essentially was the way in which we tried it. And I'll, and I'll tell you just a short vignette of this. It was very important. When I first figured that this, that I had written a, a, a piece about how great George Bush's speech in Brussels was in February of 2005, right after he had bit, uh, beaten um, uh, John Kerry. He said, we're going to restart our relationships. We're, gonna, we're going to uh, revitalize the transatlantic relationship. He was saying all the things that people like me were saying he needed to say, or our U.S. president needed to say. So I had to, apl I had to applaud it. Uh, got a lot of my liberal friends angry. At the time, however, then in March, he, he nominated John Bolton. And, and at the time that some of the leading senators said, while we don't like John Bolton, we can't beat him. He's an obscure bureaucrat going for a job no one cares about. And it was through Lakoff that I began to think about how do you have a conversation with the public and make them, one, care about this person, and two, put it in real terms so that you're having a conversation with people. And this, this race ended up becoming the single most important battle at that time that the Bush administration was fighting. It was their first foreign policy loss, or I would call it sort of a series of losses, because they lost, in my count, about seven times during a 21-month battle. But, uh, but it was, in fact, a, a, a face of pugnacious nationalism, which we tried to put on what that was going on uh, at that time from the Bush administration. And secondly, the language and framing um, uh, expertise that I tried to pick up from from uh, George and I, we talked on the phone back about that time many years ago, and so this is actually our first time to to, to really meet in person, and it's a huge honor and privilege to have him today. You know who George Lakoff is beyond being a uh, sort of revolution of his own within, uh, particularly the Democratic Party circles, but just in terms of the framing and linguistic uh, side of uh, our national policy conversations. Uh, George is professor of con uh, cognitive, cognitive linguistics at UC Berkeley and one of the world's best known linguists. Uh, he was a co-founder and senior fellow at the Rock Rockridge Institute, a progressive think tank, um, author of many, many uh, articles, including the New York Times bestseller, Don't Think of an Elephant. Uh, and this is his new book, The Political Mind, Why You Can't Understand 21st Century American Politics Without an 18th Century Brain. <laughs> or with, <coughs> can you tell I have a little bit of a cold? Um, in any case, I want to uh, welcome George Lakoff here. He has just come back from being on the Diane Reem Show today, and he uh, uh, will be speaking at Politics at Pros tonight. I want to tell everyone on the web that it's good to be with you as usual. And uh, uh, without further ado, please uh, give a round of applause to our, our friend today, George Lakoff, and I'll moderate a conversation after. Thank you, uh, thank you Steve. I, I'm, I'm a Steve Clemens fan. Um, and uh, I've been following what you've been doing for a while, and great. Uh, the, let me tell you a little bit about the title of the book and about who I am. Uh, I'm a cognitive scientist and a linguist. I, that's what I've been doing for over 40 years. Uh, and uh, I was one of the people who founded the field of cognitive science, and we've been working on a neural theory of language and thought for the last 20 years at uh, 
the International Computer Science Institute at Berkeley. Um, and over the past 30 years, an incredible amount has been learned about the human brain and the human mind, and almost nobody knows about it. What this book is, is a popular introduction to what's been discovered and why it's all important for politics. And it's not just framing, we'll get into the framing parts of it as well. But there's a lot there that you need to know about, and it has everything to do with policy making and what policy is and with what I'll call two parts of policy, cognitive policy and material policy. Material policy is what's called policy now. It's the, the nuts and bolts of how things work in the world. Cognitive policy has two parts. It has to do with, first, uh, what is the moral basis of a material policy? What does the public have to understand implicitly as common sense in order to see that policy as the right thing to do automatically? And two, what big ideas do you have to get out there in public, uh, ideas about the nature of government, about the nature of democracy, about taxation, about security, and so on, so that uh, particular cognitive policies make sense? What system of ideas do you have to get out there? Because the right has been getting those ideas out there for a long time. Uh, that's what cognitive policy is about. I'm going to come back to that in a bit. But let me tell you a little bit about your own minds and brains and mine. Um, I was raised with um, a view of, the, of enlightenment reason that most people take as their ordinary understanding of how reason works. Uh, if you uh, went to college and studied, took political science courses, you probably learned that uh, the American democracy was based on the enlightenment and that it was based on enlightenment reason. Here are the properties of enlightenment reason, which are, seem to be just common sense to most people. First, um, thought is conscious. Uh, second, it is literal. It can fit the world. Reason can fit the world. It's logical when you you know, reason is, follows a logic. It's dispassionate. It's, it's, it, emotion interferes with reason. Uh, it's abstract. It's universal, as what makes us human beings is our capacity for a general notion of reason. Uh, it's abstract and disembodied. It's not a physical thing. It's sort of floating in air. And it's based on self-interest. That is, the idea is that reason is there to serve our self-interests. That's the normal view. What has been learned in the past 30 to 40 years in the cognitive and brain sciences is that every part is false. Every single part. And let me just give you a little bit of it. The book goes into it in greater detail uh, with all the references you want and more than you want, probably. Um, let's start with consciousness. Turns out 98% of reason is unconscious. Uh, consciousness is a tiny part of what your brain is doing. And it's so, you're, it's so busy doing it that you don't notice the rest of what your brain is doing but it's there. You have a whole systems of concepts, of frames, of metaphors, etc., that you don't even know are there. You're re doing reasoning that you don't even notice uh, constantly. And we've been studying this for the last 30 years and uh, in all branches of the cognitive sciences. And it's pretty clear, you know, 98% roughly is unconscious. And the way to think about this is as follows. Suppose you um, pick some discourse, it doesn't matter what it is, a newspaper article or a book or you know, anything at all, a conversation. And you say, okay, let's look at everything involved in understanding it. Let's look at all the preconceptions, the entire conceptual system, everything you need to know to follow it and do it to see what, why it makes sense. When you write everything down, it turns out that it's about 50 to 1. The uh, part that's not in the actual words is about 50 times as much. I mean, it's just very clear. And I've been doing this for many, many years. It's just huge. Now, 50 is an arbitrary number. It could be, you know, any particular analysis might be 30 times or 70 times or 20 times or whatever. But that's the ballpark figure. And the same is true in terms of what your brain is doing when you're talking. It's not just all about talking. It's about all sorts of other stuff. So. Consci what you're mostly doing when you're reasoning is not something you're aware of. And my field is about making you aware of it. 
That's my job. My job is to help make the world aware of their minds. Now, um, the second part of this has to do with emotion. Uh, there's a marvelous book called Descartes' Error by Antonio Damasio, one of the world's great neuroscientists. Uh, let me tell you about Tony. He, he's now at USC. He used to be at the University of Iowa running their neuroscience division. And the, um, uni the state of Iowa had a very good policy. Whenever anybody got a brain injury in the state of Iowa from an accident or a stroke, a helicopter was sent by the state to take them to Tony and his wife, Hannah, who, you know, did the actual MRIs and so on. Tony did the test to find out exactly what was wrong, what people could do and couldn't do. One of the things that Tony discovered was this. If you have a brain injury uh, and that brain injury keeps you from feeling emotions, and there are such brain injuries, you cannot function rationally. Why? Think for a minute. You wouldn't know what to want. I mean, you wouldn't know whether you'd be happy with it, sad with it, feel nothing. Uh, you wouldn't know how other people would react to you. People who have such brain injuries cannot function rationally in the world. Rational thought requires emotion, requires it. Now, this is not at all strange when you think a little bit about cultural narratives. And chapter one of the book is about cultural narratives. Uh, it starts with, um, uh, actually, it's about Anna Nicole Smith and um, why people had all the opinions that they had of her. It turned out she lived virtually every American cultural <laughs> narrative you could imagine. But with the details were, are very interesting. If you look at cultural narratives, there are certain elementary ones that get combined with other ones that show up in all kinds of places. There's a hero-villain narrative uh, where there's some villainy committed and when that happens, you feel anger. There's a, a, a conventional emotion. There's uh, an encounter between the hero and the villain, and uh, assuming that the, it's not clear who's going to win, you feel fear and anxiety. When the hero wins, you feel relief and joy. Right? Those are conventional emotions. They're, they're played upon in movie after movie, TV show after TV show, and in politics. Anytime McCain is talking about victory, he's evo evoking this narrative. We're supposed to win. We're the heroes. There's a, there, the other guys are the villains. It's not clear who they are, but, you know, there, there are villains out there. And that's, that happens over and over again, but it can happen in all kinds of ways. Um, Hillary Clinton is evoking it in, the, in this race. That is, there are these enemies of Hillary Clinton who are trying to keep her from winning. And uh, they're doing all these underhanded things and so on. The same narrative structure is there. The, you know, the rags to riches structure is there uh, all over the place in people's uh, you know, um, uh, narratives. Uh, for example, uh, you go to Ohio or Pennsylvania and you're Hillary and you're talking about you know, uh, the American dream rising and so on. And if you're Barack, you're saying the same thing in Edwards. You're using that narrative over and over again. But uh, that narrative can be used in all kinds of other places. And it was used with Anna Nicole Smith, for example. These narratives have a frame structure. That is, they have roles, semantic roles like hero, villain, etc. And they have a narrative structure, what happens first, second, third, and so on, what the relationships are. And they have an emotional structure. And that structure has been traced out in the brain. Uh, Antonio Damasio has been tracing out the neural pathways for emotions in the brain and how they link to other parts of the brain so that you get uh, what's, what you feel like as a seamless structure when actually there are just pathways linking these things to different parts of the brain. Uh, there are two things you should know about pathways in the brain for emotions. There are two major pathways, one for negative and one for positive emotions. The Dopamine pathway is for positive emotions, that is things like happiness, satisfaction, awe, and so on. The norepinephrine pathway is for negative emotions, things like fear, anxiety, anger, and so on. So that when certain parts of the brain are activated, you feel fear. Now it turns out that certain narratives evoke fear, and that's what's been happening in our politics. And it's important to understand exactly how that works 
and which narratives evoke what kinds of emotions. And then there are words that are defined relative to those structures, and those words evoke the frames and narratives which evoke the emotions. So it's extremely important to, for, to, to figure out how this stuff works so that you know how your brain works, how your emotional life works, and if you're trying to resist it. And this is something important. If you hear, uh, every word is defined with respect to a frame. I, I've written this before. Uh, I talked about tax relief, for example, where tax relief uh, says taxation is an affliction and anybody who takes it away is a hero and so on. Okay, you hear tax relief, but it becomes part of your brain. And if you don't want to believe it, you have to hear it and then inhibit it. That is, there's neural inhibition, and you have to sort of stop it. But it's there. It's in your brain, even if you don't believe it. And it's important to know what things you don't believe have been put in your brain, simply by hearing words over and over again, just automatically. Now, there's another part of reason that's very important that has to do with uh, uh, the fact that our reason does not just fit reality in itself. It fits reality only via framing and metaphor and stereotypes and prototypes. That is, uh, you don't just uh, reason on the basis of reality by itself, ever. Why? Because you can't. Every thought you have is physically there in your brain, every single one. You can't think without it. You can't change anybody's mind without changing their brain. You can't learn a new word without your brain changing. You can't learn a new idea without your brain changing. Changing minds is changing brains. And that's something really important to know and to know how that works. How do brain ch brains change? couple of important principles. First, uh, there's a principle of uh, what's called Hebbian learning. That is, if something is repeatedly active over and over, then the neurons that are activated become stronger in their synapses. It's a, it's a, it's a physical chemical, chemical process. Uh, and you have no choice in it. It just happens. Now, part of this is learning metaphors, and you don't even know that when you're a child, you learn hundreds, at least hundreds of metaphors, often the same around the world, just by functioning in the world. Let me give you an example. Uh, more is up, less is down. Prices rise, prices fall. They don't physically go up. Um, or uh, somebody can be a warm person or a cold person. They're not physically warm or cold, they're affectionate. Why should this happen? Right? Think about affection for a minute. You're held affectionately by your parents when you're a child. Okay? As that happens, you feel warmth. Two parts of your brain are active in different places. Okay? The same thing is true with someone pours water into a glass, the level goes up. From the time you're born, you see this. Every time you see it, two parts of your brain are active, one for quantity, one for verticality. When you regularly have two parts of your brain active over and over and over in different places, what you have is circuitry being activated going out called spreading activation. Every neuron is connected to 10,000 others. So you have very complicated spreading across the pathways you're born with. And um, as they spread, if this is repeated over and over, the synapses get stronger and stronger along those pathways until you hit the shortest pathway where it spreads in both directions and it gets doubly strong and the others fade away. What happens is that, that you form a circuit that is the metaphor. And you don't even know it's happening. It is just happening because you're a human being with a neural brain. And that neural brains work that way. You learn hundreds of metaphors and you have no choice in it. You also learn frames, that is, you learn situations. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the history of frames. They're not just about politics, they're about everything. Uh, the great sociologist, Irving Goffman, uh, wrote a book called Frame Analysis back in 1974. Irving was a friend. Um, I have, I recently found my uh, Xeroxed copy of 
frame analysis in, a, in an old box. Um, and what Irving found was this, as a sociologist, every social institution is defined by a frame in the following sense. There are roles that are played. You take a hospital. There are doctors, nurses, orderlies, receptionists, operating rooms, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, scalpels, all kinds of things that are in the frame of the hospital. If I give you words like uh, doctor, scalpel, um, ca uh, apple, which one is not in the hospital frame? Okay, apple, normally not. Uh, doesn't have to be, whereas doctor, scalpel are there. Uh, if I tell you something, suppose I tell you a story in which I say, hey, I went to the hospital, went up to the reception desk to visit a friend, uh, the receptionist handed me a scalpel, wheeled, they wheeled out a doctor and I operated on him. Right? It does not fit the hospital frame. Right? You know by violations of the frame what's in the frame. What's in the frame are the entities, then the relationships and the scenarios that are carried out. And every word is defined relative to those frames. It's not just about politics, but it applies to politics. And you can't understand anything. You can't think without frames. And what metaphors do is link frames about one area to frames about another area. So if you understand achieving a purpose as reaching a destination, as reaching a goal, getting what you're striving toward, etc., then you understand that you, you've got a metaphor in which you're applying the frame of motion toward a destination to achieving a purpose. This is normal, happens all the time. It happens in morality and it happens in politics. Morality. What is morality about? It's about well-being, your well-being and the well-being of others. So if you ask the following question, uh, what is the correlation, you know, what increases your well-being? What are you better off? under certain, and under what circumstances? What is the correlation between a sense of well-being, which is in your brain, in your emotional system, you have a sense of positive emotion for feeling well-being, and something that happens in the world, okay? It turns out, if you eat pure food, you get a sense of well-being. If you eat rotten food, you don't. So you get a sense of morality is purity, and immorality is rottenness. That was a rotten thing to do, okay? Not just in, in, in not just here, Around the world, there are purification rituals, right? Uh, you're better off if you can, uh, any, ask any one-year-old, if you can stand up and walk than if you have to crawl along the ground, okay? Morality is uprightness. Being immoral is being a low-down snake, one of those vermin underground, as they said right after 9-11. Um, and so on. Uh, you're better off if you listen to your parents than if you don't assuming in most cases that they're trying to, to, to help you, well, then morality is obedience. You're better off if your parents are taking care of you than if nobody's taking care of you. Morality is nurturance, uh, and so on. There's about 22 of them. Uh, there's a book uh, that I've written with Mark Johnson called Philosophy in the Flesh, where we go through all of these cases for hundreds of pages. Sorry, <laughs> but it, if you care, it's 600 pages. <laughs> But it's, it, it's a complicated thing. Now, how does this enter into politics? What is your first experience with governance? In your family. It's in your family that you're told what to do, where people, you know, um, and, and enforce that. Uh, as a consequence, you learn that a governing institution is a family. And you don't just learn it here, and you learn it by the time you're seven. Any seven-year-old knows that George Washington is the father of his country. Uh, they don't worry, they don't confuse George Washington and Daddy, right? They've learned the metaphor and so on. Now, what's important about this is that uh, there are lots of governing institutions. The church is a governing institution where you have a Holy Father, for example. Uh, there are, uh, mar the market is an institution and governments are institutions. And it turns out we understand the nation as a family and in America, we have two major different kinds of idealized families, not necessarily real, they may not be your particular ones, a strict father family and a nurturing parent family. And 
it turns out that the structure, the moral structure of a strict father family, maps on to conservative notions of government, of religion, of the market, and so on. And I won't go through the exact details here. They're written out clearly in the book. But they work on, the, uh, the, we, the, we, if you want, we can raise it later about how it, it gives rise, for example, to a conservative view of the market. Uh, the same, correspondingly, there's a nurture and parent family where nurturance is about empathy and uh, caring and responsibility. So a nurture and parent uh, sets limits be to protect their children. To, they care about them and they raise their children to be nurturers of others. And that means they raise their children to care about other people and to be responsible for themselves and others. Uh, you apply that to politics and you get progressive politics. What's interesting about this is that we all learn both systems. We're in a culture where both are there and uh, you may use most of one or most of the other, but let's suppose you're a nurturant in every part of your active life, but you can walk into an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie and understand it, then you have a strict father model in your head. Right? You don't walk out of the movie saying, what was that about? You get it. Now, what's important about that is there are a lot of people who are partly conservative and partly progressive. And they are maybe progressive about certain issue areas and conservative about others. Progressives about domestic policy and conservatives about foreign policy or the reverse. All kinds of combinations exist. There is no linear left to right order. All kinds of combinations exist. It's not the thing. Compare Joe Lieberman and, and Chuck Hagel. Probably agree on nothing. <laughs> right? There, uh, you know, one is and one is pro-war and relatively liberal. The other is anti-war and conservative. You know, it's not like there's a there's a, le a place on the left to right spectrum for them. Uh, and they're both called moderates. Uh, there is no ideology of the moderate. It doesn't exist. It's a combination of the other two. And the other two are modes of thought, and they may not apply to your literal family. They may be used ideally for something else. And that's important to understand. But very often, they do. And in fact, the greatest determinant of how you will vote is how your parents voted. That's not an accident. Now, um, what, why does this matter? Well, it turns out to matter a great deal. Uh, there's another very important piece of neuroscience that you need to know, and that has to do with what are called mirror neurons, which you've probably been hearing about. There's a, if you haven't heard about mirror neurons, there's a great book that's just come out called Mirroring People by Marco Iacoboni, uh, as in Iacoboni. And uh, he's, it's, it's a beautiful introduction to how this works. Mirror neurons are neurons that fire when you either perform an action or you see someone else perform the same action. Okay? It's not a miracle. We know how it works and what the circuitry is that does it and how it develops. And it turns out also that, that those neurons are connected to your emotional regions. And therefore, you can tell when someone else is afraid or angry or happy by how they look. You can tell by looking at somebody what they're feeling and what their emotions are, and that's how you can feel someone else's pain. That's how what empathy is. It can be in someone else's shoes. It turns out empathy is the basis of progressive politics, and Barack Obama has been talking a lot about empathy. Now, what's interesting in the Obama campaign is how much he talks about it and how little the pundits n mention it. I don't know if you've ever heard anybody ask a follow-up question about empathy, but let me give you some examples of where it has shown up. If you go and look at the Selma speech, it's about the empathy deficit over and over and over. If you look at the Philadelphia speech, there's this place where he says how we have to improve to get closer to the, uh, uh, the principles of our country. We need more freedom, more fairness, more caring, and more opportunity, but more caring, right in the middle. The next day, Obama is interviewed by Anderson Cooper on 360. Cooper asks him, what is your view of patriotism? He says, patriotism begins 
with caring about one another. From that, all of the basic principles of our, for, of our, of our government arise, freedom, uh, fairness, etc. Okay? Uh, he's asked by Ann Curry, what is the most important thing that your mother taught you? He says, empathy. To know what it is to be in someone else's shoes. That's what the basis of human kindness is, and that's what we need in leadership. Okay? It's crucial that that is what is picked up. And if you listen to Obama's stories, to his narratives, they are all about empathy. They arouse empathy in you. That is the centerpiece of his campaign, never discussed overtly. They're working beneath the surface where it's most effective, where it needs to work best, but not discussed. But very important, it is there. And he does discuss it, but no one asks him about it. Why? Because when you went to college, you weren't taught that the basis of American government was empathy. And yet, you should have been. Uh, there's a remarkable book by historian Lynn Hunt at UCLA that takes on the traditional thing that is taught in the political science departments, which is that uh, government American democracy is based on self-interest and maximizing self-interest. That uh, it turns out in 1776, uh, Wealth of Nations was written by Adam Smith. And the claim is that um, the wealth, that the idea of uh, a free market is the same as the idea of uh, democracy. That in both cases, you're using your reason to maximize your interest, economic or political. Uh, and if you want to see the very best description of this position in one paragraph, read The Assault on Reason by Al Gore. I mean, beautiful description of this position in one paragraph. Now. Um, which I quote. It's a, you know, a lovely, lovely thing. It's false. Lynn Hunt went and she looked at the Declaration of Independence where it says, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, dot, 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 that all men are created equally, endowed by their creators, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And she said, when did it become self-evident? She's a historian of this period in uh, America, England, and France, and she checked it out. And she asked, did it become self-evident in the Enlightenment in the 1600s? Nope. None of it there, even though Descartes was writing then. Did it become self-evident in the 1700s? Well, yeah, about when? About 1750, 26 years before the Declaration. Why? How did this happen? She checks it out, and it turns out it happened culturally. Because in that period, you started getting novels, stories, paintings, drawings about poor people who were, uh, who were being oppressed and being tortured and being harmed. And they were stories and pictures that aroused empathy. And it was through that that Jefferson eventually got this idea. It turns out that our government was based historically on empathy, not on interests. And that's an important thing to know. Obama is historically right. Now, what does this say about public policy? Uh, there's a long description in here, uh, a whole chapter, on the rational actor model in economics, foreign policy, and so on. And there's an even longer description in a book called Philosophy in the Flesh, the 600-page monster. Uh, of the actual cognitive structure of the rational actor model. Uh, let me give you a little of the history of that. Um, w back in the 1980s, uh, I sat in on um, uh, international relations seminars in graduate school at Berkeley, where they were teaching the rational actor model in international relations theory. And it didn't make very much sense to me at all. It was just seemed like nonsense. But I went to the, one of the people who was teaching it, uh, who is uh, a friend, who is a mathematician. He was the, the main person there. And I asked him, what is the pure mathematics behind the rational actor model? And he says, well, it's game theory. Um, 
you know, and I said, but what's the, you know, pure mathematics behind it? Where, where does it come from exactly? He went and he started looking up the books. He, I said, after all, if they have to prove things using theorems and axioms, you know, where do they get the axioms from? Turned out that none of the books had it, although he was a mathematician and he used axioms all the time. So I said, okay, let's work it out. I was trained as a mathematician as well. And uh, let's, let's go and figure out what the axioms are. Well, it turns out the axioms come from two branches of math. You would expect probability theory. And also, they come from uh, what's called formal language theory, uh, which are axioms for developing trees. These are decision trees. And uh, in philosophy in the flesh, there's a precise mathematical description of this. You look at the mathematical description, you say, what does that have to do with rational action? The answer is nothing. It's just a bunch of axioms. Well, how do you get a bunch of axioms to be about rational action? The answer is metaphor. You need three layers of metaphor, one to map the axioms into a tree, the other one to say that in this tree you, with labels, that in these labels are actors, are movers, that they move from place to place in the tree. So they're, they're going along this. So you, you first have to, to put, put it in terms of paths and locations and movers to a final location. Uh, and then you have numbers at the end of this location, uh, which are probabilities and um, you know, certain other numbers. And then you have to have another layer of metaphor that says that this is about action. And that other layer of metaphor is universal. It says that action is motion, and that purposeful action is motion to a goal, to a direction. And that a choice of action is a choice of, of motion, a choice of path, a course of action. Okay? Once you have that, and then you have the numbers being probabilities and utilities, then you get a decision tree. And once you have that with, those, with the math and three layers of metaphor, you then have to have another layer of metaphor to apply it. That is, who is the rational actor? Is it a consumer? Is it a firm? Is it a country? Okay? And you need another layer of metaphor to apply it. It's all metaphor. and this, this is described in this book in a chapter and so on. But it's all assuming that rationality is only about self-interest, not about empathy. What's happened in behavioral economics is we've discovered that we don't think in terms of the rational actor model. My former colleague, Danny Kahneman, uh, who did his work at Berkeley before he went to Princeton, uh, got a Nobel Prize in economics for showing that people think in terms of metaphors, frames, and prototypes, and certain other uh, general patterns of thought that do not fit the rational actor model and do not fit enlightenment reason. Now, if you go to policy places, economic policy, social policy, they all use the rational actor model. And not only that, if you're a Democrat, what you will wind up doing is using interest-based policy. As you'll find an interest group who, that, whose interests have not been sufficiently served, and then you'll come up with a government program to serve those interests and hope they'll vote for you if you support that program. Right? That's the standard way this works. And that's what Hillary Clinton's campaign was about until Pennsylvania. Now, let me explain why and why Obama's campaign was not like that. Um, a couple of years ago, I ran into Richard Worthlin at a conference. He was uh, the chief strategist for Ronald Reagan in 1980 and 84. And uh, I took him out to lunch and asked him, what was it like? He's a very nice gentleman. Um, he's retired in his 80s now. Um, and he said, well, actually, it was pretty confusing. Uh, I um, was hired by Reagan. I had been trained at Berkeley uh, to believe that people voted for candidates on the basis of their policies. I did my first poll for Reagan and found nobody liked Reagan's policies and everybody wanted to vote for Reagan. And it was very embarrassing because I was his chief strategist. I had no idea why anybody wanted to vote for my candidate. So 
he said, I went out and I did surveys, had focus groups, etc., and I finally figured it out. Reagan talked about values, not just about policies. Policies were, were when he talked about them, exemplified values. People believed what Reagan say, said. He came across as sincere, and Worthland thought he was sincere. Uh, I have doubts about that, but Worthland <coughs> didn't. Uh, but certainly people did think that Reagan, Reagan said what he believed, that he was authentic. Therefore, they trusted him. They knew his values. He, they, could, they said what he believed. They might disagree with him, but they knew where he stood. He could communicate and connect with them, and so he, they identified with him. And they ran the campaign on values, communication, authenticity, trust, and identity. So I watched those debates between, with Carter and Mondale. And as a good Democrat, I thought that Carter and Mondale wiped the floor with them. And they did on the issues. But Reagan won the debates because they weren't about the issues. <laughs> they were about those five things. Okay? Obama's campaign has been about values, authenticity, communication, trust, and identity. And in fact, if you look at that, the attacks on Obama are attacks on those things. Attacks on trust, that is, uh, you know, what about his pastor? Now let's take a, for a minute, just a little bit, why do they use the word pastor over and over? When did you last hear the word pastor before a few months ago? Right? Turns out there's a reason, there's a metaphor here. Pastor comes from the metaphor that of uh, the shepherd and the flock. And the idea here is that the flock is a flock of sheep who will follow the pastor. If you didn't have that metaphor, it wouldn't work. The attack on Obama would not work at all because, after all, I mean, if, if they assumed that people in a church would just be free thinkers, uh, not worrying about what the guy up front said, it wouldn't work. Okay? So that's why this works. It uses that metaphor, and, um, and then, you know, and it's repeated over and over, and, and that works. Now, but it's an attack on trust. It's an attack on <coughs> values, on patriotism, and so on. And you get all the other attacks on Obama, for example, on communication. Well, it's just rhetoric. It turns out, despite the fact that he has, you know, 100, 200 policy advisors, you know, vast numbers of papers and all of this stuff, and he's a great student of policy, you know, doesn't matter, it's just rhetoric. That's an attack on that. And that's a frame. It's a rhetoric frame. And the rhetoric frame says that rhetoric is empty. It's just empty words as opposed to things you really believe. In fact, I've been attacked for that as well, because I talk about framing, and people think that I'm just advising people to use empty words, when in fact what I'm doing is trying to have people understand how they think and what they hear. So this is important to see, that uh, Obama is doing something very different. Hillary was doing the policy approach, and she was losing until Pennsylvania. And then she shifted to the other approach, to try to be something different. She changed her voice when she, when she campaigned there. She changed her body language. She swung her hips more. She was looser. Her voice went down an octave. She changed her hairstyle, right? It's, you know, the idea was she's one of the common people. Didn't matter that she went to Wellesley, Yale, et cetera. If Bush could pull it off, why couldn't she? And she did. Now, you might say, following Bill Goldston, that this is just a matter of personality, and that really politics should be based on policy, not personality. But it's very interesting to, to think about this, because it isn't just personality. If you realize that um, a president is, not, is going to face new problems that, you know, all the time, that when they're running for office, they can't anticipate everything that's going to happen by, by a long shot. What do you vote for them on? What's, what does it make sense to vote for them on? Their values. 
whether they say what they believe and whether you can trust them, whether they're really communicating with you and whether you identify with them and support them. That makes sense. It's not just a matter of personality. Now, let me turn back to what I started with and finish up. I started with the notion of cognitive policy and let me give you an example, uh, one example of it and then stop. Uh, we have before us the Lieberman-Warner bill. Uh, and um, it has an implicit unstated cognitive policy which says that uh, companies that have polluted and made money via polluting, via externalizing their, their costs in that way, <clears throat> deserve to keep on making the same amount of money. That's what it says, because we're going we're to grandfather them these permits. Okay? It says that. That's, it doesn't say it overtly. It's, in, it's an idea that comes out of the policy. There's an alternative view put out by Peter Barnes, which has not been put into effect at all. And nobody has a bill for the Barnes bill, though the pieces of it are slowly getting out there. Barnes wrote a book called Capitalism 3.0. And what he suggested in this book was the following. He said, we all own the air. And it's important, that's an important idea, because you have to know that nature is valuable. You have to know that the air and the rivers and the airwaves and the, you know, and the oceans are valuable, that the forests are valuable, and that we own them. And not only that, we can't transfer our ownership of the air. It's an inalienable possession. Well, he says, how do we get this idea out there? He said, there's actually a policy that will actually work to reduce global warming. We have to reduce it by 80% in 40 years. He says, here's how we do it. We look at where carbon-based fuels enter the economy. They enter with suppliers, with Exxon, other gas companies, coal companies, etc. And we know how much they sold in the previous year. And we know and we can tell how many tons of carbon dioxide that fuel produced. And we start out by reducing that number, 2%, and we sell them permits. We say, hey, if we own the air, you've been <coughs> dumping stuff in our air without paying us a dumping fee. Well, from now on, you're going to pay a dumping fee and you, we're going to not let you dump as much year after year. So what we're going to do is we'll let you buy permits to dump 2% less this year, 4% less next year, et cetera, 2% a year less, and you have to buy them at auction, free market, auction permits, and see how much profit you're going to make selling your gas or whatever, and buy them at auction, and that's going to produce hundreds of billions of dollars in profit. Where does this go? Not to the federal government, but to a trust. It gets transferred electronically into an Sky Trust, and that trust then delivers the money electronically into the bank accounts equally of every American. About $1,600 a year into your bank account, month by month. Okay. What does that say? He says, you get a dividend on your ownership of the air. And that value goes up every year because the, the, the value of the permits goes up because, they become, because uh, the ver permits become more valuable. There's less of them, go less of them around. It's a purely market-based solution, but everybody becomes a capitalist equally, simply by their birthright. Somebody dies, it's gone. Somebody's born. They get a new bank account, they get it in there. Now, in addition to that, people spend that money. As energy costs rise, they can offset the energy costs because they get the money, not the polluting companies. But in addition to that, they get the money in the right form because it says they own the air and the air is more valuable if it's clean than if it's dirty. Now, pieces of this have come into various proposals. Barbara Boxer took the part about auctions, and auctions may very well ultimately be there. Barbara Boxer uh, put on an amendment 
saying that some of the 14 percent of the money should go back to the people, but she did it in the wrong way. She said it should go back in terms of tax credits rather than dividends for owning the air. That is, she wasn't looking at the cognitive policy about changing people's minds and therefore their brains. That is what policy needs to be. It needs to be, pay it as much attention to cognitive policy as material policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Fascinating. Uh, let me open the floor for comments, uh, questions, and, and uh, uh, cries of uh, protest or applause. Uh, yes. Um, do you know where the concept of homo sapiens originated? Because, I mean, it seems to me that one of the great political philosophers, and we don't usually think of him as a political philosopher, but the Republicans have really understood that he's a political philosopher, George Orwell. And, I mean, I believe that we are really that, homo That's a good limit. So why don't we stop there, because we have a lot of questions. So homo sapiens and Orwell. But if you can speak into this for the, uh, uh, yes. for the, for the mic, that, or you can have this and I can stand here. Sure. Way, but I okay. want to, we've got folks on uh, There is a book out uh, called What Orwell Didn't Know from a conference. I have a paper in that book on just this issue, <laughs> <laughs> saying exactly pretty much that. Orwell got it wrong. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Heather Hamilton, the Connect US Fund. Um, I'm interested. I'm interested in understanding um, what you think about how the foreign policy framing worlds, wars are playing out with the shift in with the election and the shift into post 9-11 politics and the real sense that we have that the public is coming to a very different place on what they expect from the federal government and the president in terms of foreign policy and so what, do, what are the metaphors, what are the stories that you're seeing playing out and how should advocates of a more responsible, engaged foreign policy be engaging with those stories? Thank you for the question. Uh, let me begin with uh, something not discussed. There's a lot discussed here. Um, one of the things not discussed is one of the um, major parts of Barack Obama's foreign policy. Uh, if you compare this to, let's say, Clinton's policy or what's taught in graduate schools, what's taught in graduate schools is the rational actor model that says that foreign policy is about states, that each state is a rational actor, that the, each state uh, uh, naturally max seeks to maximize its national interest, and its national interest is three things. It is its economic health, that is the economy, the GDP, uh, its military strength, and its political influence. Those, that's the national interest. That's what you're taught. And that diplomacy is about each country going out and doing this. And the assumption is if, each, if everybody goes out and maximizes their interests, the interests of all will be best served. Utterly false, but that's uh, a version of the Adam Smith thing and, and a version of the rational actor model. Obama says something very different. He sees foreign policy at the level of people. And if you look at the American prospect uh, description of his policy, which talks about human dignity, he says, look, foreign policy is not just about states. I mean, states have to be there, and you have to have them, and you have to have diplomats going through states, and so on. It's not that you ignore it, but rather, Certain things that were not considered foreign policy now need to be. Hunger is a matter of foreign policy. Uh, the uh, environment is a matter of foreign policy. Uh, refugees are a matter of foreign policy. Women's education is a matter of foreign policy. Child labor is a matter of foreign policy, and so on. And he says this right out in two ways one overtly, but also in his stories. Watch his narratives. When he tells you a story about an Indonesian chicken farmer who is so poor that he, when he found out that uh, his, um, uh, his chickens were infected with SARS and he had to sell them to make a living, he says, that chicken farmer's poverty affects us all. Right? that public health is a matter of foreign policy. 
and that is a major departure in foreign policy not discussed in the media because they don't teach it in graduate schools. They should, but they don't. What is interesting is a quick follow-up to Heather's question. What is interesting with Barack Obama is he's not completely there, though, I, as I've been a critic yeah. of, of pretty much everybody out there on the foreign policy side, but uh, except I'm a Chuck Hagel guy, which shows you my problem. Uh, can't win them all. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, but the interesting thing is that, that, say, for instance, you've got Jimmy Carter saying, we're going to go talk to Hamas, largely with the notion that, you know, Obama's message was sort of engagement, trying to replace a high fear globalization with a high trust globalization, engage, solve problems, and we're not going to get stuck with old style state structures. In two areas, he's not done that. One is uh, with Raul Castro. He has a very highly conditioned approach to sort of thinking about changing the only relationship in the world where the Cold War got colder in the last 10 years was in U.S.-Cuba relations. And, and while he's opened up a bit on Cuba, he's not even back to where the Bush administration was in the first three years of the Bush administration. And, and then on Hamas, where I had Brent Scowcroft, Brzezinski, everybody on board saying someone, it may, may not be the United States, but someone's got to deal with an engagement strategy for them. And he went out of his way to, to basically criticize Carter. So I'm interested that on that, that doesn't seem to be of the same spirit. That seems to be a more mercantilist calculator of interests with specific voters in mind? I don't think so. Hmm. I think what's happened is that he sees the political environment he's in, in Florida <laughs> and in the Jewish community. That's a mercantile calculator of interests. And he sees that, <laughs> it, that this is part, and by the way, he's very interested, very interesting in the audacity of hope. Hmm. He comes out and says, hey, you know, if you're going to get elected senator of Illinois, you had better talk to the agriculture industry and the mining industry. Uh, but he's very, he does it in a very subtle way. Let me tell you about that and then go back to foreign policy. He says, look, uh, I'm for clean coal if sequestration is economically feasible. Well, it turns out last week it turns out it was not, and everybody knew it wasn't going to be, and anybody who, you know, <laughs> but he puts this clause on. I'm for nuclear energy if it turns out to be economically feasible. Well, that's not either. You know, the government spending on that would be huge. So he, he, he hedges his bets in the appropriate way. He is a politician, and that's how it is. And I think that's what's happening here. But in talking about, um, you know, opening up f uh, families, going back to visit in Cuba and to bring their money into Cuba and so on, uh, what you have there is a person-to-person -person policy, the beginnings of it. But there's something else about this talking to people, and he hasn't gotten this framed well yet. When uh, a leader goes out and talks to another leader, they also wind up talking to the people of that country. It doesn't happen that he would go to Iran and not give a speech to the people of Iran. And that is crucial. It is direct policy and something that communicates to those people what the people of the United States are about. That's not said, but I think that's what it's what's behind it. Thank you. Uh, Gary, do these up here and then in the very back. Uh, George, uh, Gary Mitchell from the Mitchell Report. Uh, uh, I, I want to ask, I want to get your thinking about uh, Israel-Palestine. Uh, the, 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 the consensus is we all know what the final two-state solution is going to look like within, uh, you know, yards uh, of, of uh, how the settlement go, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we keep coming back to the same points, the settlements, the roadblocks, et cetera. What I'm interested in is whether you think uh, w what needs to change in this regard is around the metaphors and the, and, and the frames and the narratives. And, and if you've thought about that, could you share a little of the, your thinking with us about that? Um, I thought about it all too much. Um, First, um, the strict father, nurture, and parent world is there in the Middle East, too. It's there in Israel, and it's there uh, with the Palestinians as well. You have the same break. But, you know, probably 70, what the polls show, over 70% of each want peace. They want reasonable solutions. But the governments are not permitting this, and those, uh, that other 30% is, is making it impossible. The question is, can you open up 
uh, relationships between people. And this is something, again, that's a very interesting thing about Obama. He's looking at not top-down solutions, but bottom-up solutions. He's asking, what could you do to have people-to-people -people contact that would change this? Now, it's not there in negotiations, because if the negotiations are done at the level of the state. But the, there are further other kinds of things that could be done that he's not, I don't know if he's thought about them at all, but there are things to be done that people in those countries are doing in terms of joint art projects, in terms of joint communications projects, uh, at joint education projects, and so on. And that, that's eventually what has to change. Thank you. I'll go here. And we're going to make these very brief questions if we can. There are too many of you and not enough. Mark, so Mark Naturno with the Interactivity Foundation. I came here because I wanted to hear you talk about something that was in the title, uh, namely how to manipulate irrational voters. It caught what my... Mean, is that's it? Not is that not you? That's not me at all. I, I, I was reading a little, so anyway, go to your question. Okay, well that, I wanted to hear what you were going to say about that. That's not for you. I, I, I don't do that. Okay. Yeah. Not only that, I mean, I, I had not yet read the book, which I've now skimmed through at the time I wrote this, and I was sort of thinking, well, this is enlightenment via mind versus not enlightenment. So I was using the wrong frames when well, I wrote the title, so my apologies. But very quickly, because we really... Yeah, it, it caught my eye because I had just read George Soros's new book, and he refers to you, and he talks about the manipulative function of language, and he talks about how his theory of open... to that by manipulative. Well, he talks about Karl Rove in, yeah, it, with regard to the manipulative <laughs> function of language. But he also talks about manipulative with respect to markets and so on. Yes, but also with respect to politics. That's and this right. is what and, and this is this is what he caught my attention. Me of being a bad manipulator. <coughs> well, what, what Soros talks about is in his notion of reflexivity, which which to not get into the great detail of all of that, George had done several talks of this, is is what the administration had done and robed it, and I often say it well, that the president came in and won a contested <coughs> election, but came out acting as if they won 80% of the vote. Yeah. And afterward, yeah. the Democrats in that election caved. And, and since then, particularly after Ron Susskind's yeah. book and others, you had this notion that this administration had the sense that it created its own weather. It was not a react, it, it determined reality. Yeah. And to some degree, what George was saying is, that is true, yeah. in part because they did it. Uh, uh, well, but, but, the, <coughs> markets, markets but, but the question that I have is, is that, you know, when I first you know, read your stuff on framing, of course, these things come rather close. And, and one begins to wonder, um, uh, and when I read you know, George's book on, on uh, the new paradigm, it sounds somebody can read that as saying, we, ne we need to learn how to do this better. Let me answer that. There's a big, what, what the right has done over the last 40 years is build an entire conceptual system into public discourse at every level, at the highest level and all the way down on issue after issue with a language and training people and getting the word out there and repeat it over and over to keep that, that conceptual system in place. Progressives have an implicit set of values and conceptual system, but they haven't gotten it out there at all levels in public discourse. As a result, the right wing can easily make up a new slogan to fit that, and we can't. You can't just, frames don't occur by themselves. They occur as part of a, of, of a system, and you have to piggyback on what parts you have, and you have to start building that system as soon as possible if you're going to say what you really believe. What I've been doing is saying, progressives have not been saying what they really believe. They have to say it effectively. Now, I'm very much against the use of spin, et cetera. The examples I gave before, I think, are, are gross. And usually, eventually, the truth comes out. <coughs> I mean, it's better to say what you believe. Thank you. In the very back, just, just speak up. Yes. You, you talked about the Democratic primary, how Obama ran on things like values, authenticity, communication, et cetera, and met with success, and how, how Hillary <coughs> ran more of a traditional policy-oriented campaign until she shifted in Pennsylvania. What are the lessons for Obama coming out of this, going into a McCain-Obama general election, and how to proceed? Well, first of all, McCain's doing the same thing. Uh, McCain is not coming out as a policy wonk. He is presenting himself and branding himself uh, as, you know, Mr. Straight Talk, the hero, 
the expert on foreign policy, the com you know the natural commander in chief, uh, the person who's who's going to you know gar guarantee victory, etc. So I mean, if you look at the way that he has pre pre presented himself. He is saying, okay, you know, here are my values. My values are patriotism. My values are strength and re resolu being resolute. And my value is our honesty, okay? Those are the values. I'm straight talk. I'm authentic, okay? You can trust me because of that. Uh, I connect with you. I go out and I just talk. And I talk to reporters on the bus. You know, why is he on the bus? He takes the plane, his wife's corporate jet, from place to place. But he goes on a bus to show the idea that he's connecting to the working person. He's connecting to the um, uh, conservative populist. And, and this, by the way, is very important. I didn't talk about conservative populism, but it's a, a very important thing to understand. It is not economic populism, it's cultural populism. And what, uh, they, what the conservatives have done since the 60s is try to take uh, liberals who were seen as the party, Democrats were seen as the party of the working people, and they've made them into the liberal elite, the limousine liberals, the liberal media, et cetera, as if they're making fun of ordinary working people. And they try to have conservatives be the party of the working people. This is what, what they have succeeded in doing. That's what, the, what Reagan did. And they did it by focusing on a real biconceptualism. A lot of working people have strict father views in their family and in their social views although they may be nurturant in their, uh, you know, in their unions, in their uh, views about nature, and so on. But what they did was they concentrated in talking about uh, the strict father views. And when they do that, they activate those views in the brain. They activate the strict father part, and they make it stronger. And when it's stronger, it can spread by, by spreading activation to other areas. And that's exactly how they've been working. Um, Edwards misunderstood this. He thought that populism was about economics. It's a mistake. J.P. Singh. Thank you for your very affectionate presentation. I wanted to go back to a comment you made right towards the beginning, which is about 95% of the so-called rational action is unconscious. And I wonder how you see the 5%. Is it a solution or is it a paradox? And, where and aren't you the journal of, uh, aren't you the editor of Journal of Rational Choice Theory? Review of yeah, policy yeah, yeah, yeah. cases. No, but I... I, I <laughs> <laughs> Pretty close. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if I could just build on that, to me Adam Smith represents a moment in terms of the narratives of Scottish Enlightenment which speak to self-love. And the notion of the self uh, how do we situate that in the 95% or the 5%? Uh, and what, where is the theory of value here, as to quote Marx? Is it the 5% or is it the 95 And what's the connection between the two? Uh, first of all, the conscious thought builds on unconscious thought. So it's the unconscious thought <coughs> that, that is shaping the conscious thought. That's, you know, that's just the science. Um, about Adam Smith, it's a wonderful book recently came out uh, about Adam Smith, uh, going through the history of it. And it turns out that uh, Adam Smith uh, originally was a proponent, uh, was a progressive. And he was a progressive in the following way. Uh, at the time, farmers and craftsmen could not just sell their wares and their produce anywhere. They had to go to particular markets where um, people who were uh, designated by the king and nobles would, would uh, collect a tax from them for everything they sold. And um, this uh, wasn't terribly great, and it was a progressive move to enable free markets, that is, let people sell what they want to anybody at all who wants to buy it. The idea of the free market was not maximizing profit, but just being free of these constraints. Right. This was changed in about a dozen years uh, uh, by conservatives. And um, Edmund Burke changed the idea into what we have now, which is the free market is supposed to be just about money and maximizing your profit. And, if the, if the, and the assumption is it's normal 
people are normally self-interested, so it's natural, it's moral, because then the profits of all will be maximized, and so you have the free market is, uh, you know, is supposed to be moral and natural. Totally false, but that's the view. Now, what, what you get in progressive uh, views of the market is that, uh, that you have built into the structure of markets are always constructed. They're not just, they don't just come about. And they're constructed with regulations being part of the structure of the market. Think, for example, the, the prescription drug market. Okay? Now, we don't have a hallucinatory, hallucinatory drug market. Right? There's a reason for that because uh, the assumption is that, that markets are constructed for the good of the people. And that certain, <coughs> certain markets should not be there for the good of the people. And um, the result of this is that constraints on this, namely the FDA should, you know, uh, check out the drugs, should be there for that. Now, it turns out in the Bush administration, uh, the FDA had all of its spec inspectors and drug inspectors taken away. And then the government monitoring moved to the companies. Government didn't go away. Government stayed in the companies. It was transferred, the government companies then <coughs> govern your life. And, but uh, not on the basis of accountability to the public, but accountability to profit, and therefore you get the FenFen and the Vioxx suits because they fudge the data. Okay. But you get a very different understanding of the market from a progressive point of view. I want to give Mikey Sh Mike Schaefer the last, uh, you had your hand up, right? No, I no you didn't. Okay, one last question right here, and then we're going to break so that folks can be get books uh, from politics and pros. And, and, uh, I teach a course on uh, discourse analysis, and I have uh, as the first module uh, your work. I, and I added uh, Drew Weston's book, uh, The Political Brain, which came out last year. And I wanted, the question I asked my students is actually to contrast that work to your work. Um, how would you describe the kind of differences that you have with other people who are working in this field? Um, okay. So uh, your students will be able to watch this video and get the Sure. Um, Drew's a good guy. He's a very, very good neuroscientist, very smart guy, and a, a colleague, and a respected colleague. It's a good book. Um, there are a couple of limitations of the book, uh, which is not to put it down in any, po any way at all. One, he focuses on emotions because that's his field. He should focus on emotions because that's what he does and he does good work. Secondly, um, when he talks about networks, he's talking about frames and metaphors. Uh, and he's right to talk about them as networks because that's what they are normally. Uh, he just, he, on page 222 or something, he mentions that they happen to be the same as frames. But um, basically, he's talking about framing as well. Uh, he, there's a lot of stuff he does not talk about in there. He doesn't talk about the mirror neurons, the stuff on um, limitations of self-interest. Uh, he, you know, there's all, all kinds of stuff not that, that's in here that he doesn't do. But uh, I cite his work. His experiments are excellent. I have nothing but nice things to say about him. In closing, before I ask all of you to thank George for a, for a fascinating uh, discussion, and I, I will encourage people to come spend time with him, I want to mention that um, New America has two things going on that I want to uh, mention. I've been just told that we've got 20 seats left. I didn't know we had for a really cool film screening tomorrow evening uh, called On the Road uh, in America with this new Sundance Channel series. So um, I haven't had a lot of time, so if anybody wants to go, uh, let uh, Sam know. And uh, just uh, if you are, if you don't show up, because it's a fantastic crowd going, but this is this new 12-part series about young Muslims in America who are going around. It's fascinating. Uh, and the second is uh, uh, in more of the wonkery world, but uh, we'll talk about empathy with him as with the chairman of the National Intelligence Council, sort of the smart spy crowd, about how you actually put together a national intelligence estimate given the controversies we've had. And so we'll try and bring up empathy and, and the sort of uh, other dimensions of this well that go into sort of how do you package intelligence to deal with Iran or questions on Iraq and things like that. That's on Wednesday at 12.15. So please help me thank George Lakoff for I'm going to bring back here right now so we can spend some time uh, talking to him and, and getting books and uh, uh, having them signed. <laughs>